Rob, thank you so much for coming on the show. It means a lot to have you here. You are the chief product officer and co-founder of Rally. Tell us about Rally and how you became and got to where you are today. Yeah, Clint, thank you for having me, dude. I appreciate it, man. Um, I mean, listen, long story short, uh, you know, we created Rally for ourselves, myself, and my co-founders to start. So the short answer of what is it, it's, it's kind of like a stock market for collectibles. So we take everything that has has gets a lot of people excited, has created value for the wealthy over time, and we fractionalize it and turn it into kind of stock. So it's everything from dinosaur fossils to classic cars where we started to, you know, Warhol paintings to game war Michael Jordan sneakers. It's all of these really important collectibles that in our mind belong in a museum, but they also belong community owned. So it's almost like the ability to invest in the things that you really love. And we've been working on that independently myself, my co-founders, Chris and Max, as as friends for a long time in the asset classes and in the collectible spaces that we loved. And for me, it was always a mix of art and sneakers. For Chris, it was cars. For Max, it was baseball cards. It was something that we knew that the most exciting museum quality examples of the things that we loved were living somewhere, but it was probably in some, you know, really, really wealthy person's storage locker somewhere. So in our mind, if we could take those things, bring them to life and make them accessible to everybody, we could have a business that fulfilled our own wants and needs, but also, you know, millions of individuals who really care about these items, but they're kind of stuck behind the velvet rope. How did you actually figure out the whole financial system to this? Like how this would actually work? Did you just like look at like Wall Street, and you know, different markets like that? Like, how did you figure this out? Yeah, I mean, we, to be honest, like we guessed a little bit early on. This was in, in 2014, we started talking about this. It was on the heels of crowdfunding kind of taking hold of the collective zeitgeist and Kickstarter and Indiegogo and all these platforms, some for real estate were starting to come out and really kind of test the limits of what they could do with an offering, with kind of like an IPO. Um, and the Jobs Act, which was this, this legislation from 2012, came out and it was pushed by those companies, by those crowdfunding companies. And it allowed what, what you would consider regular people, everyday people to invest in what the government at that point deemed riskier assets. So those are like private companies and, you know, crowdfunding campaigns. And before that, you needed to be an accredited investor. You need to have, you know, a million dollars in net worth or have made a couple hundred thousand dollars a year over the course of years to kind of prove to the government that you were a sophisticated investor. But for us, we always looked at ourselves as potential sophisticated investors. We didn't have the money, but we had the knowledge base. And I think that that was the big unlock for us was that Robinhood at that point was starting to gain some traction. It had the the um, the early kind of waitlist version of Robinhood that became the real platform. Coinbase was new, but in 2015, people were starting to pay more attention to crypto. You had all these mobile first platforms that were coming out and they were engaging millions of people really quickly because there was this, this democratization of finance that was happening all around us. The last kind of category that was left was collectibles and alternative assets. And that was something that we had a very, very unique view on individually. All of us were collectors in some capacity, but you never had access to the best stuff. So we would go to like auctions and go to like Barrett Jackson at this big car auction in Arizona. We pop in there and, and kind of get a feel for the room. You had, you know, a hundred thousand people would show up at these events. They're all behind a velvet rope and you have four or five people bidding on individual items. And that to us was just this aha moment where it was like, listen, we know this stuff probably better than some of these owners. We have no access to it. There's no way to get the museum quality stuff. There's no way to add it to a portfolio. The regular investor is stuck buying whatever's left over. And that's, you know, by the time it trickles down to someone like me early on back then, if I wanted a comic book or a card or want to buy like, you know, a watch, I'm getting whatever's left over. I'm not getting that from the source. I'm cutting through five, six, seven different middlemen before I get there. And whatever's left is mine. So now that we had the Jobs Act in place and you had non-accredited investors can make investments, you had the structure to kind of turn things into companies, which we sat down, talked to lawyers about, realized it was possible. And we had this domain expertise ourselves and in these individual asset classes. It was like, all right, we could maybe make this a business. And then we started kind of putting thoughts on paper, b- building the demo out. And all of a sudden you look down and you're like, damn, dude, we have a, I think we have a business here. And that, that kind of led to a lot of better conversations with potential investors and VCs and early users. And then, you know, as life often does, seven years pass, and now it's something that's a little bit bigger than we expected, but also something that definitely is super rewarding to be able to sort of see where it came from having built that from that one concept seven, eight years ago. Yeah, it's huge. It's an incredible product you've built too, which I want to talk about here in a second. But at the beginning, when you are um, 
thinking about raising money, talking to investors, talking to venture capitalists, all this type of stuff. What was that process like? What did you learn from it? What advice would you have for people who are going through that? Yeah, I mean, listen, everybody tells the story of like how many doors close and how many no's you got along the way. We got, you know, 400 no's or whatever it was early on. I think there were two parts of it. This is in 2015, 2016, we first started to raise money. Um, and we were like going in very cold, finding people's emails, DMing people on Twitter. Luckily, VC in general, I'll, I'll say for all the bad things that people will say about venture capitalists and, and the greed element, and they're not really your friends and all the things that are probably true for the most part. They're very, even the biggest VCs, the ones who have a name who you can Google and find out are in your industry, they're always really receptive to the cold pitch. And we started with Twitter DMs and we started with like a very, what I thought was a really pretty deck, but didn't have a lot of substance that explained what the market opportunity was. That opened a couple of doors, but there was still a bunch of no's. Some of the no's that we got early on were just, you know, it's not, it's too small right now. Let me know when you have some data. Um, a couple were a little rougher where there was one, one billionaire, a well-known tech billionaire in particular, who we got on an email chain with, with him, his financial advisor, and myself, my co-founders. We set the pitch. Um, he sounded like he was interested. And then it kind of got circumvented by the business manager who stepped in and said, this is a big no for us. And if you want to know why, um, you should read chapter six of my book. And he linked us to Amazon to a book that he wrote. Now, those things are like along the way are always going to be a little bit of a knockdown. But what we realized coming out of that process, the early process of trying to use the idea as the hook was that we needed something tangible. So we built a demo and it was mostly a puppet show. It was a little bit fake. It, it linked into like what would be a back end in the future. But it was a version of Rally with a few cars and a carousel that you can click through, see all the details, see the price mechanism and some charts that speak to provenance and detail and authenticity and then make an investment um, with you know the equivalent of probably 10 or 11 clicks start to finish. And I think putting that in the hands of a few of the people who were receptive early on was what put us over the edge. And those people didn't necessarily invest, but they made introductions to people who had significant domain expertise in marketplace or in consumer or in collectibles or in auction houses. And having that sort of feedback in hand on a phone where they can click through it was invaluable for the product, but also in terms of letting them know it's not just an idea, it's real. And I think that's always... Any advice I give to any new entrepreneur or someone, especially starting a digital product or anyone doing hardware, is that everybody is receptive to emotion, whether an, a sophisticated investor or a VC, they're always going to say, you know, take emotion out of investing. They're lying. Everybody looks at something and when they see something and touch something and it has that haptic, a haptic response and they can click through start to finish and feel it in real life, there's an immediate reaction. You can see it in their face, whether they like it or not. And they're way more, um, they're halfway there to making that investment if they can really see it and understand it in real life. And that's always what we kind of focused on going forward from that point. Did you read the chapter? No, nah, I didn't. I, I, I look at that email every now and then, man. I, I look like once, once every like five or six months, I'm in like the doldrums. I look back, I'm like, this guy really told me to buy his book. And that's, the, it's like, what? And now that particular person who we were, we were pitching, I'll see like pop up on TV or something every now and then. Just like man, I really want to connect with this guy and ask if he's still working with that business manager. But no, I haven't. I haven't. Uh, I never read the book. No, that's hilarious. It's hilarious. He wouldn't send you a copy of the book. He actually wanted you to buy it. That's nah, great. I mean, listen. If you, anything that's worth we'll doing, it. if it's good enough, you should charge for it. You know, I, I'll give him credit yeah. for that. Like, send me the link and send me to Amazon. But yeah, I don't know. He didn't get his uh, residuals off off my purchase. That's for sure. <laughs> that's awesome. Tell me about building the product because you really built a uh, unique, fascinating product. How do you think about, I mean, and you are the chief product officer, obviously. So how do you think about building products and what is your process like? Yeah, look, my process has always been um, a little bit different than what I would consider um, like the Ivy League product managers and product designers who really want to sort of start with bare bones, wireframe through the, the, the research process, through a discovery phase with new users, to onboarding in small batches, A-B testing, and then releasing pieces. I've always been, I've always taken shortcuts for the better, for better or worse, personally, um, from a product perspective. I've tried to lead with intuition. I think the business that we're in, in that we have to find collectibles that people love, we have to syndicate them to thousands of people, we have to tell stories effectively. That to me was always a, a mix of intuition and taste. And I think that's the one thing that the standard kind of, the PM who runs product now at most startups and most companies, especially bigger companies and, and giant organizations, you're not gonna get away with just having taste or just having feel. But early on, I think when we started putting thoughts on paper, it was gonna be sort of a finance app, but we wanted it to look and feel way more like a consumer experience and more like buying a pair of sneakers on, on Goat or anywhere in a marketplace that wasn't about finance. 
So I started doing, uh, we did a lot of competitive analysis early on and did the brand twin exercise and really focused on brand as the pillar. But a lot of it was initial sketches. I skipped straight to the pixel perfect designs at that point. And this was in an era when, you know, Photoshop and, and a few other platforms that are no longer, a, you know, Figma runs product design at this point. Yeah. But at a time when it was really about the visuals and we looked at two apps at the time that made a lot of sense to me in terms of consumer experience. One was a company called StockTwits, who uh, the founder wound up being our first investor. And it's kind of like a, um, it's a forum style communication tool for people in finance to talk about individual uh, stocks and to add sentiment. And it's, you know, it's very much kind of a timeline feature. Then the second was an app called Maple, which was from uh, David Chang. It was a food delivery app. Uh, it was in a couple of markets here in New York. It was really about telling the story behind the ingredients and kind of, you know, why they put this dish together. They had only five or six individual items on a menu any given night. And it was all kind of sourced in a, in a really interesting way that it told the story of. And it was this really nice paginated experience. Those two pieces kind of blended together. I took the best parts of both and design what would be kind of like the first product page for our products, for our individual collectibles that told the story effectively, that allowed for a little bit of communication with us and with other individual users um, and kind of told the whole story. But we pushed the buy, the idea of investing all the way to the back because we were trying to flip it on its head. Everything at that point, because of Robinhood more than anybody else when we launched, was about making the investing experience seamless. And it took a lot of the heart and the soul out of investing. It became get in as quickly as possible, very binary outcome, Finance in general is a zero sum game. It's always about make as much money as possible and get out. Mm -hmm. And we knew that wasn't going to exist. That was a race to the bottom for us. So we looked at it and said, let's just flip it. We'll turn it into a product that looks and feels more like a magazine, has the elements of those two products that I spoke about, tells a story effectively, and the button says explore. And the deeper you get into the product, the more it becomes, you know, some of the imagery strips out. And then you get to a point that you can make a purchase and invest in any of these individual assets. But that's, you know, six clicks away from the front page, from the initial experience, which is the worst thing that anybody could do in a transactional app is make it so they have to go find the place to purchase something. But that for us wound up being the magic early on because we weren't trying to push people into an investment. We were trying to lay out as much information in the most interesting, visually appealing way as possible and answer some of your questions to reinforce your intuition. And then you can make the purchase. So we kind of developed the product knowing that that was going to be the archetype who we were going after with the same thought process, make it as interesting visually as possible, give them the opportunity to explore and go deeper into the product. But by the time they get to the purchase decision, we're probably going to be able to capture the majority of those potential investors because they've gotten this far with us. Today's Robinhood's probably something like OpenAI or ChatGPT, right? Um, how are you thinking about AI and integrating that into your platform? I think that, again, going back to the common theme that we've always had here is that we want to reinforce intuition. You want people to have a well-formed investment thesis by the time they get to rally, but then you want them to sort of get in and maybe see something, some wrinkle they didn't know existed before making that purchase that kind of says like, all right, I was right. I'm directionally correct. And here's the details to fill in those blanks that I didn't have. That's where, I, for me, that's how I use AI right now. That's how I want it to be in our product. I think at a certain point, we'll have no choice but to integrate it into the process. But I've never thought about AI and I've never wanted AI to be like a creative crutch. I think that a lot of what we see right now is visuals and, and imagery and it's, you know, it's, it's, you know, thesis papers and it's kind of like, you know, pumping out a bunch of articles. To me, that's a little bit, you see it and it feels a little bit soulless. And I think I've never wanted that to be the way it integrates into rally or into my life. I wanted to pick up on, on the things that I just A, can't find or B, don't want to do. And I think that that deep research that goes along with so many of these individual assets, not the storytelling part, but the actual nuts and bolts of the way something is made, uh, a little bit of a nuance around sort of the authenticity mark or the provenance around an individual asset. I think having those and along with some of the price action and be able to sort of get a some predictive analytics that you can apply to your investment thesis or fill in some of those blanks on data that maybe might have escaped you or us in that process because it's either super new Maybe it's super old or maybe it got lost along the way, but AI can kind of fill in those blanks and create that bridge. I think it's going to be a really interesting part of the way it works in finance because right now it's so much of AI. When I see it and I see friend, the way friends use it, it's like, you know, g give me the, a winning parlay for six teams tonight in, uh, in, in the AL and the NL in baseball. And that's like, to me, is it, it's a very front of house way to do it. And then the other side is like, make a pretty picture of a kid in a field, you know, playing with a kite. And it spits out something that has like seven fingers on it or something crazy. 
there's somewhere in between that feels a lot more like application to my to to my knowledge base right now and expanding my knowledge base on something that I know 80% about. Give me the other 20%. And that's where I see it fitting into our product. That's how I'm trying to use it more every day. What does a typical day look like for you? How do you decide where to spend your time? Yeah, I mean, I wake up, I think about every single regret in my entire life, and that's like 30 to 40 minutes to start the day. But that's then I it. get to it, you know what I mean? I'm hitting these streets. I'm trying bad. to sort of, I'm trying to take in as much of what's going on around me as possible and trying to start the day creatively. I think I've been, I've tried to do more where, you know, our product right now lives in a place that's very, um, it's, it's super useful for the people who use it every day. And I think that we have tend, as humans, we tend to get lost in our routines and our ceremonies and it has to get changed up every now and then. So for me on a regular day, you know, after going through all the regrets, I'm sitting down, I'm going through some email, but I'm really thinking about the, the product and the pieces that are missing right now, not for a week from now or two weeks from now, but trying to think about big picture. I'll sketch some stuff out. I'll throw some ideas on paper. I'll share that with some of our product team, usually probably around midday. And then the majority of what I'm trying to do is for the rest of these days is really sort of work on relationships. And that's something that for three, four years, when we were putting this business together, so much of it was hammered and nail. It was find some assets, get some demand pools going, make sure we're, we're you know, pushing this across content that we're doing enough to make sure people know who we are, what we have, and how to get your hands on these individual assets and shares of those assets. And now it's about sort of scaling the business. I think that we've been lucky in that a lot of people have invested in our company, a lot of individual investors who've come in and invested in assets. They know that we're here for, for the long term. And if they look at it like it's not that flash in the pan, two years, three years, everyone makes a ton of money, we sell the business and get out. They see it as something that's developing, not just for Rally as a platform, but for these asset classes that are relatively new. So a lot of what my day has been is sort of thinking about how we scale this business. And that's talking to, whether it's talking to individual sports leagues or it's talking to sort of asset owners or auction houses, thinking about a way that we can acquire and having the conversations for the best way that we can acquire assets, that we can make money on those assets for our, our investors, for ourselves, for the business, and then exit those assets when the time is right and doing all of that with the right people. And this is an industry, considering that we're in 23, 24 different categories right now, it's got so many different players and a lot of those relationships we've kind of been forging for the better part of five or six years. And they're at a point now that the cream has kind of risen to the top and the people that are going to be around are still here. And those are the conversations I'm trying to have for the bulk of the middle of each day. And those are the ones that I think they don't necessarily pay dividends right now, but in the future, they'll be incredibly impactful and meaningful for our user base, for our investors and for the future of this platform. That's what a lot of my focus has been outside of trying to make sure that I'm doing as much design and doing and getting as as many thoughts on paper so you don't lose that edge because man I'm I'm getting a little bit older now and I see these young kids now these these 18 19 year old 20 year olds they're running circles around me when it comes to the actual design so I can't lose that I'm trying to stay I'm trying to do as much of that as possible early in the day when my brain is still firing you know Yeah <laughs> And what is your relationship like with the leagues and how did you build that relationship I mean, we got, we got lucky early on when we sort of started, when the platform started growing, the asset class that worked best for us and the one that, that generated the most interest, generated the biggest returns and got the most investors involved was in the sports category because it's, it's a huge pool with massive fandom and then a lot of collectability that goes with it in a bunch of different places. So whether it's trading cards or game war memorabilia or tickets or it's IP that right now, when Top Shot came out, when NBA Top Shot came out, that kind of changed the dynamic around what IP actually is and what it means in the future. It had a, the attention of the collective masses of retail, of institutions, and of these massive leagues that wanted to foster the relationship with all of those people. So when we were raising our uh, our Series B, we were immediately started thinking about what leagues can we talk to, and we got a bunch of you know athletes involved in the NBA and in Major League Baseball. Uh, MLB as an organization came in and was part of that round as well. So it's always been, you know, when the time is right, let's talk about, you know, doing something together. I think that that was to us started over the course of the last year. And we've gotten way more focused as game more memorabilia has taken off as sort of us and our relationships with athletes and individuals who love sports and the fans of sports has grown. The assets on the platform that matter most are the ones that matter most to fans as well. I think that for us, we've gone to each of these leagues individually and we talked about what it could be to sort of open up access to fans in a more meaningful way to the past and to the future. So we started talking to a few people about like what that looks like. And it's likely, you know, the way I hope to see it in the future is that right now I'm in our museum space here in Soho, which is like a physical space, has a bunch of our stuff on display. It's open during the weekends. We have a little coffee shop in the front. I would love to take this and have this be a carve out in a stadium at some point or have it be in arenas. Mm. And you see now when, when gambling sort of, you know, when, when sports gambling became 
less faux pas and not just accepted by everybody, but also integrated with the leagues. That to me was a pretty obvious moment in that, you know, every fan is a speculator in some capacity. Every fan, you know, cares about, you know, having them putting their money where their mouth is. There's a way to do that with gambling and there's a way to do that with investing. And I see this as the, as not just a compliment to what the leagues and what teams are doing right now, but as a way to grow fandom and to sort of have something where when I, when people walk into this museum, I see it all the time and they own assets, they own shares in any of these assets. They're with their family. They're telling them all about it. They're saying when they bought it, they're talking through the history of the individual item to be able to do that in a stadium, in an arena for a team that you follow generationally for your entire family. And it's been passed down to you. I think is a really important unlock. We've seen it a little bit in kind of fantasy sports and gambling parlors in individual stadiums worldwide. I think the next step for that is collectibles and the idea of, you know, Yankees having Monument Park and also having the space where there's a bunch of collectibles that you can invest in on the spot or that you own shares. And when you go to that game is where I want to see this going. What do you know now that you wish you would have known at the beginning of your career? Oh, man, I'm, there's a lot of different ways to get money, I think is the big one. Like we, we immediately went for VC money. Some of it's been good. Some of it's been bad. Some of our relationships, for the most part, relationships are great. But in reality, you know, I see a lot of people who bootstrap start to finish. At this point, for us, it probably wasn't an option. But there's, a, there's, a, there's much more to be said, and we're starting to see it now, in having independence and not being beholden to somebody else's view of your product. As, convi- as much conviction as I've always had about this business and about what we've built, I'm, I'm not impervious to other people's opinions. And especially when someone's given you 10 or 15 or $20 million, it's kind of like the, the conversation starts and their opinion is right. There's, there's no world where I'm telling them, nah, get out of my face. That's, you're wrong. You have to listen to it. I'm a bad listener at times. Someone talks to me and tells me what I should be doing, what I shouldn't be doing. I'm immediately on defense. Like that happens all the time in my regular life, in my personal life, in my work life. But when someone's giving you money, I think that I'm always way more open to what they're telling me as it kind of should be. And as I expect from some of the investments that I have in, in other platforms, other companies, other products. But I think I would have, I would have probably stuck to my guns a little bit more along the way with a couple of bumpy spots in the, in the trajectory of this business. And I think that for new entrepreneurs, it's just, it's, it's almost cooler to be independent. It feels way more impactful and like way, and way more accomplished when you've raised no money you've grown a business to 20 or $30 million, which in the VC world, that's such a small, small amount of money and such a small potential exit. But when you own 100% of that business, that's a massive, massive opportunity. You really built it from scratch. I think, I, I think early on, I probably would have explored maybe, maybe skipping a round or two more than anything else, but also alternative financing methods or thinking about starting smaller and not having to accelerate immediately, which would have allowed us to think a little bit differently about the way we raise money. What are you reading or what reading recommendations would you have for us? Man, on a, I don't read enough. Like what I've been, what I've been doing more of, like I, I took off from podcasts for a while and then I started reading a little bit more. And now I got back to podcasts again. I think that when you're in tech, you get caught up in a lot of like the Malcolm Gladwell-esque kind of like yeah. mix of self-help and business. And you're trying to pull little idioms and, and analogies out of those individual books that talk on podcasts and have conversations like that as well. But for me, I'm trying to, I'm trying to think more about what we have built and the nostalgia that goes with it. I actually started, I started reading old Goosebumps books again because they're, they're all over our office. And that to me is like this nostalgia, but it's also when we bought them for this company, um, for the museum that we're in right now, all of a sudden they were like, it was $1,200 for all 63 editions of that. I'm thinking in my head, like this is, it goes back to like the Scholastic Book Fair days yeah. and it goes back to summer reading. And it's these things that now we're on this cycle where Gen Z and Generation Alpha are so in tune with what happened in the 90s and the 2000s. There are all these things around that I kind of missed early on. It's not just like catching the ride type stuff. It is like these weird little goosebumpy type of books that are 75 pages that are written in such a unique way. You look at it now and I realize it was telling the future. It's the same movies, the same IP that's getting rehashed right now. And that to me is what I've been doing just from a business perspective to better understand what was going on in the 90s and the early 2000s because I forgot so much of it at this point. And there was so much cultural currency in those individual titles and the things that I think me as someone who kind of grew up and came of age in the nineties took completely for granted. And now when I walk around at Soho and I see people, I know I see 18 year olds dressed the same way I was dressed in 2005. It's crazy to me, but I'm trying to read and ex- and take as much of that culture back in right now. So I don't lose it because if you don't pay attention to the past, you can have no idea what's happening in the future. And that window right now of what matters and the cultural currency that matters 
is this really tight time frame from the late 90s and early 2000s. So I've been, I've been trying to pay attention way more to that. What have you learned about the power of nostalgia? There's two parts of it, man. Nostalgia, it could be fantastic and it opens up this, these parts of your brain that you kind of forgot existed, but it can also be toxic. And I'm trying to avoid that, that, that toxic nostalgia. And when I say toxic nostalgia, it's more about implanting these moments that never actually happened or weren't as good as they kind of seem. It's, it's one of those things where, you know, a memory is only, is only surfaced related to the last time you remembered it. It's really, for me to remember what happened when I was like three or four years old right now, I have little flashes of it, but I don't remember anything in, in real detail from before I was 17 or 18 years old, other than little moments. But when I think about like Christmas Eve at my aunt's house, who was two doors down from my apartment, or when I think about, you know, what was happening in high school and certain moments and certain like things that I bought with my own money for the first time, I think about nostalgia as a, as a way of a reconnecting with like good times, but I want to make sure I don't get lost in it. And in the business that we're in with rally, it's really easy to get lost in nostalgia and make up an entire story about something that happened in 1997 that probably never even happened. And now I'm chasing that moment in my real life. Now I'm trying to, I'm trying to do a little bit less deep nostalgia dives and do a little bit more use it as a little bit of a platform to get to the future but sparingly because i don't want to get lost in a, in a time that's never going to be recreated you know what are some products apps or tools that you have to use every day that are like integral to your daily life yeah listen, i've gone way back to analog so i'm at a point now that like i'm not wearing a watch today and i feel absolutely naked right now like i forgot to put a watch on walking out the door and that to me has like always been this mix of like, I want to show people the things that I care about, but also I want to go stay back on an, in an analog world because I can't even pay attention to everything. It's so digital at this point. But outside of that, like I've gotten to, you know, as, as horrible as a phone is to have on you at all times, I do start end my day and everything in, in between when it comes to everything from video editing to emails, all of it has gotten so comfy on my phone at this point. I'm trying to get further away from it now. We have, um, on a day-to-day -day now, like we have digital timers that I keep in the office that are like really well designed and pretty from like the MoMA store that count down 20 and 30 minutes at a time so you can get relentless focus. I use that on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I'm still very, very deep in Photoshop. I think that for me, the ability to edit and do it in a non-angular kind of freeform way, I'll probably be one of the dinosaurs that's using the creative suite forever into the future. But that's a must. There's never a day that Photoshop doesn't get open on my computer, on my phone or somewhere in between. Um, and then in terms of like getting from point A to point B, I've also gone back a little bit analog and I'm just taking city bikes everywhere lately. I've kind of tried the sunset Uber from my life and I've taken the train less. I'm trying to sort of be now that we have a little bit better weather in New York, that's been my day to day. And the way that that system works in New York has always been really interesting to me, the city bike system in New York. Um, and the way that it hasn't somehow it's avoided knock on wood, what happened with like bird and lime scooters where they just became a disaster in every city and you wind up seeing them throwing the garbage and set on fire and there's never, the docks never work. That's a system that's been really interesting to see come together in New York and over the course of, you know, half a decade at this point to be as relevant as it still is. That's the one piece of technology that is this mix of analog and digital. That's always really, I've always paid attention to, but I've been using way more, way more often uh, lately. What role has New York city played in your whole um, journey and in the journey of the company? Yeah, it's I mean it's all of it. Like to me, it's it's such a it's such a New York centric thing to say like this is the greatest place in the world, but it's really hard. It is. It it absolutely is. And it's hard for me coming from Brooklyn and now like I live in Manhattan now and obviously our business in Manhattan. You're in this world where, you know, Brooklyn is part of New York City. But when we were younger, it'd always be like we're going to the city. That was always like the way you said it. And it's like the city just meant Manhattan at that point. You tell anybody outside of New York like, yeah, the city, they're like the whole, what, what's the city? It's the whole thing. It's like, yeah, there's 11 million, 12 million people here. It's the whole thing. It includes Brooklyn. But this to me is, is this aspirational thing that I've, I've come to appreciate more over the course of the last probably five to 10 years, especially in starting this business. Because when we launched, in my mind, it was, it was the taste level and a curation and this density of population and of things that people care about that we needed to represent on Rally. And that to me was a direct representation of New York. So when we launched in California and particularly Northern California became our biggest market and then Los Angeles became our second biggest market and New York was third to me, it was almost like not a failure, but I felt like I, I was like, how do we not have, a, you know, 10,000 users from New York knocking the door down right now? We built this in this city for this city. Every my, myself, my co-founders are from this city. 
me and Chris, my CEO, my, my original co-founder are from Brooklyn. And all of our friends are from Brooklyn and, and met parts of Manhattan. How is this not something that's winning in New York? And you realize that the, what we've done here, I think what the city has built is, is mimicked in a lot of different cities, but it's kind of like New York goes everywhere. And that's anywhere mm -hmm. you are, you're going to find somebody from New York. You're going to have a conversation about New York. It's going to be about, you know, New York versus Paris. If you're from Paris, it's going to be that fight. It's going to be New York versus Berlin. If you're talking to them, it's a creative outlet. It's a place where you can walk outside and see all the things that we have on this platform. You'll see them one way or another. You'll see a, you know, a Lamborghini drive down the street randomly. You'll see somebody, you know, at a restaurant that has a hundred thousand dollar watch on. You can see these things everywhere and anywhere. And that to me was always the indicator when we built this platform, what we should put on the platform first. And that's why it was. It was cars and then it was, you know, sports and some trading cards. It's such a massive sports city. It went into watches, wine, handbags. It was all these trappings of wealth in New York. And we want to sort of knock the door down first here. It was surprising that we, we got to this one third, but now we realize like it's all part of the, the idea that New York is everywhere. And the concept is not the concept of like, you know, investing in culture and only the things you care about is not New York centric as much as I think New Yorkers want it to be. And as much as I want it to be ours, it is something that translates everywhere. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, what advice would you have for entrepreneurs and leaders uh, now that you've been in this game for um, as long as you have and you've seen some success? What advice would you have? Yeah, I'll say, you know, I've had so much failure along the way and I've, I've always kind of embraced it. I think I try and make sure that everybody here understands that too. I do a bad job at a time because, you know, I let my passion and my temper get the best of me at times. I've, I've been trying to fight that for you know, almost 40 years at this point, I'm trying to how long I've been in, in, I've been in the workforce now for, you know, 20 years. And a lot of what I think about is how to, how to be a little less emotional, but I don't have, I really have trouble doing it. And I think that that's, that's the biggest thing that along the way, having gotten fired so many times and sort of, you know, had projects that just didn't take off the way I wanted it to, you get hit in the head over and over and over again. You have no choice, but to use it as fuel. I've always kind of enjoyed getting fired. Like to, in the last two jobs I had, getting shown the door is just like this, this free moment for me. It's like weight off the shoulders. It's like, this wasn't the place for me anyway. And I tried to, I've tried to use that as best I can, but, um, I got fired maybe two jobs ago. This is in 2012 or 2013. And, uh, I'm talking to my dad and he was, he said something that stuck with me that I've been using that I've been, I stole from him. And I use all the time now. It's like, whether you're right or wrong, if you're an asshole, you're wrong. Like, it doesn't matter how good your point is. It doesn't matter how, how smooth you get it across or how it's articulated. That's the absolute truth. I'm guilty of it on a weekly basis still. I'm trying to knock that down. It used to be on a daily basis. I'm trying to knock that down to like a monthly basis and then get that, get that kind of attitude when things don't go your way out of my system entirely. But for a 19 or a 20 year old now who's just getting started, especially as a designer or as somebody who has to take critique, I think being able to understand that someone who's telling you something is wrong or telling you that you didn't do something right is not, especially in a job, is not telling you their personal belief. It's telling you something that represents the future of the company or the business or your future. It's just maybe not the right place for you. In any conversation, any deal, any sort of sales cycle you go through where you can't appreciate that, you know, even when you're right, sometimes you got to take a backseat to the conversation. It's something that I learned the hard way without question, and I'm still working on it. But that's that to me is something that I don't want to be the guy who's saying the next generation, they don't, they don't appreciate anything. I don't want to talk like the way the previous generation did about millennials. Cause that's not true. These new kids are the most, they're going to be the most successful generation ever. And they're so creative and they're so on point with the way they think. But I think they've been, they've gotten really used to kind of accepting criticism from a distance. And when they get it face to face, it triggers a lot of emotion from them one way or the other. And they want to kind of mobilize and like protest against it literally and figuratively at times. And sometimes it's not the right way to get the point across. Sometimes taking that, that confrontation and turning it into sort of a positive and thinking about, you know, how do I present this conversation in a way where if I need to, to be around these people or have this conversation again in a year or two years, it's not something where I burn this bridge down. It's an important part of, of, of a, a creative journey and of a career journey. I learned that the hard way a bunch of times. So like, I've always preached to that next generation, like whether you're right or wrong, again, like if you're, if you're saying it the wrong way, you're talking crazy, you already lost that battle. It's not worth it. How do you think about um, your mental health and staying grounded and what, what do you kind of do throughout the day to kind of make sure that you don't completely lose it given the times we live in? I mean, I do, I do sometimes like there is, there are times where it's, it is too rough to handle and it's, I don't ever want to be like a poor me, but there are times which is it's, it's walking away a lot of the time. I think what I've done is literally 
trying to be outside more and trying to change the environment up and change the routines, those ceremonies and, and the, the kind of things that you do on a day to day to ground yourself that you want to remain consistent with are super important. But changing the scenery literally and figuratively is a super important part of that too. There, there are there are days where it's just not working from the office is not the right place to be for that day. There's going to be you know very hyper focused work. You want to get rid of all the distraction around you, but also you want to be in a different mental state because I want to sort of open up my ideas and open up the the ability for me to design and create in a way that's different than that standard ceremony, that standard kind of the typical day to day. I think getting away from it. I'm I'm as guilty as any entrepreneur any any CEO or founder or whatever, where it's you don't take vacations, every single day is work. There's never a day where the computer doesn't open. There's never a day where emails don't get answered. I kind of expect the same at a lot of people that are at our company, especially the, the senior people who I've been with over the course of the last four or five years who know what the expectations are. But stepping away from it um, and literally going for like that 45 minute walk where it feels like I'm gonna be doing something that's counterproductive is the only way to be productive. It's It's conversations like this too. It's talking to people who are, creative in the space that you don't necessarily see on a day to day is a huge part of it too. I tried to say yes to more things. Um, you know, saying no is important too, but I've tried to say yes to more dinners and, and more events and speaking on more panels and doing things that put me in a room with a bunch of people I'd never met before, or people that I'm not necessarily comfy with to the point that I'm texting them all day or I'm in group chats with them. I think that's an important part for a mental health perspective too. Because if you're doing the same thing over and over and over again, there's just there's diminishing returns there. It's not going to be something that that provides you with what you need to be successful in the future, especially if you're already in a mindset that's a little bit tight or it's a little bit you know complex at the moment. Getting away from that complexity with new people, new places, is something as simple as taking a walk in the sun for 45 minutes has changed the way that I think about the day on a day-to-day -day basis. Finally, we ask an end of your interview with the same question, and that is at CEO.com. We believe the chances one gives is just as important as the chances one takes. When you hear that, who gave you a chance to get you to where you are today? Yeah, I got. I have, I have two people that have done the, something I've tried to do more of, especially with young designers. I was, I got out of school. I was a super raw designer, and I was skipping so many steps, which I still do to this day. It's the worst thing you do as a designer, <laughs> and I was going straight to like you know the printouts at that point back in the early 2000s when it was all logos and like package design and you were literally drawing fonts by hand this i sound like a dinosaur right now but that's what it actually was i had no portfolio i had a bunch of loose pieces of paper i had a couple things in an email it was messy the first person was um a guy named john monopoly who's kanye west manager now and that was like my first job at a school was was doing a bunch of design for kanye and he looked at he saw an actual printed piece of material that i had at a print shop in queens and asked the owner of the place, I was going to pick that all this stuff up in a box. And he said, who designed this? And the owner gave him my number and said, you know, we're starting this label. I want you to come in and meet a few people. And he gave me the first chance where even to this day, I still, he still asks me for stuff every now and then like files from 20 years ago. And I'm like, I make sure he gets his stuff all the time. Now he was the first person who, who allowed me to sort of say like, listen, here's the budget. Here's what we're trying to do. It's a, it's a tour for John Legend or it's whatever it's going to wind up being throw some ideas together. And that was the first time that I was allowed to sort of think about not just here's the the nail, here's the hammer, just get that done. It was the first person who said like, do whatever you want. And if it works, you get rewarded for it. If not, we'll go back to the drawing board. And that was like a really important part of my early career. Then the second was once I sort of got into startups and started working on products, a previous CEO, John Lima, who is somebody that I, I just talked to, I reconnected for, for the first time like a year, like a week ago by chance. Um, same situation. I didn't have digital design. I had a lot of physical, tangible design at that point, but he kind of saw something in me and I don't, he's not a designer, he's an entrepreneur and he's a money guy, but he looked at it and said like, you know, this is something that even though we're making apps, we're just, they were, at that point it was a company called Scroll Motion. We were designing for, you know, Vogue and for Esquire and these huge magazines that really cared about the aesthetic. He saw that the aesthetic, even though it wasn't digital, it wasn't for apps, it wasn't for iPad or iPhone could translate to digital design, it could translate to product design. And that was the, literally the first time I even heard the term product designer, when in my mind, I was a graphic designer. And I think that's, those are two people who kind of saw what the work and the potential and didn't think about it in terms of fitting into the box of title. So every time that I've hired now to this point, based on those two experiences, has been more about, is it a cultural fit? And is it somebody that I could work with on a day to day? But is it somebody with a refined level of taste that could be executing in a bunch of different various verticals. And if I needed a t-shirt or a website or an app design or interactive design or augmented reality, 
this person has enough of a design eye to build that from scratch without worrying about what the discipline is. And, you know, those are, those are two people who did that for me. So I've been trying to do that as much as I can in my career. Rob, thank you so much for coming on. Seriously, an incredible product. Uh, I mean, I, everybody knows who you are, but everybody should check it out. Point. It's thank an you, incredible, incredible, it. incredible product. And um, it's genius and, and well done on everything you've done. Man, sincerely appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. A great conversation. This was the therapy session for today, dude. You asked about this was it. This was the this was the forty five minute walk. We sit with you and talking through life. <laughs> Perfect. Let's do it again. Let's do Absolutely. it every day, man. For sure. <laughs>